Hey everybody, uh, my name is Kimberly Tommy. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Witwatersrand. Um, I am currently pursuing my PhD in biological anthropology. So before diving into the topic of my talk today, I feel that it is important that we take time to remember the Soweto uprising, to truly take stock of what happened that day, in the days leading up to it, and in the days that followed. Often we are told that these things happened in the past, and that apartheid is over. And while all of this is true, the apartheid system has had long-lasting effects on South African people, impacting almost every aspect of our lives, including our socio-economic standing, and importantly, and often overlooked, our emotional and mental well-being. It is a trauma, and it is a trauma that was endured by one or two generations, but one that will be passed down to every generation to come. And we need to acknowledge this. We have to acknowledge the hurt and the pain and the effects of systemic racism because it is not going to go away. So we have to remember this always. On the 16th of June, 1976, an uprising began in Soweto and spread throughout the country. This uprising would have profound effects on the socio-political landscape of South Africa at the time. This march was meant to culminate in Orlando Stadium, but en route, students were met with a heavy police presence. The police used tear gas and live ammunition, injuring and killing many students. Some of these students were under the age of 18. The most famous image from this day was taken by photographer Sam Nzima and is that of the deceased 12-year-old Hector Peterson. This image and the death of Hector Peterson as well as the images of police and law enforcement opening fire on children would be shared the world over, highlighting the brutality and injustices of the apartheid government. In order to understand June 16, it is important that we look back and gain a sense of what motivated the uprising. This began 20 years prior at the introduction of the Bantu Education Act engineered by Hendrik Vervoet, who was quoted as saying, there is no place for the black child in the European community above the level of certain forms of labor. What is the use of teaching the black child mathematics when they cannot use it in practice? He was also quoted as saying that black people must be taught from an early age that equality with Europeans or whites is not for them. The quality of education, as well as the facilities given to black, colored and Indian students was of a lesser quality than of white students. And this is particularly true for black students. The government at the time was spending over 10 times the amount on white students as opposed to black students. There was overcrowding in classes, there were unqualified teachers and failing infrastructure. This extended beyond primary and secondary education but into tertiary education. With the introduction of the Extension of University Education Act in 1959, which prohibited black students from attending what were known as white universities, mainly the University of the Witwatersrand and the University of Cape Town. The tipping point was at the introduction of the Afrikaans Medium Decree in 1974 which made Afrikaans a medium of instruction alongside English in schools. It should be noted at this point that students, teachers, and many others had been protesting this entire time, perhaps not on the same scale as the Soweto uprising, but apartheid, the Bantu education system, and those acts related to education were never passively accepted. There was always pushback and always a fight for human rights and for dignity. This was not just a change in language, it was reinforcing a power dynamic. It was saying, we do not care for your education. We do not care for your understanding. Weaponizing education is a strong move. It is a move that allows violent and ongoing oppression. It says, not only do we want to control your movement, where you live, how you live, where you can work, as did other apartheid laws, it says, we want to control your mind. We want to break you mentally. We want to ensure that you are not equipped 
to escape this reality. We want to make sure that every generation after you suffers the same fate. Because even the apartheid government knew that there is power in education. There is power in awareness and they tried their best to snuff that out. It is this buildup of events and many others that I haven't mentioned that led to this uprising. It wasn't just about a language, but let's also take note that language is a very powerful tool. This was about a system designed to ensure the ongoing oppression of non-whites. I believe we are constantly making history. Um, it's not something we think about all the time, but it is definitely something we're doing all the time. Um, if you think about it, who, who thought we'd be living through a pandemic? Um, and that's going to be part of history. That's something future generations will learn about. So it's important that we understand that nothing we do goes unnoticed. And as someone who studies the past, I understand the importance of documenting these events. Um, the Fountain of Youth is a mythical spring um, that restores and rejuvenates anyone who drinks this like magical water that's found in the, in the fountain. Um, and it's something that has been mentioned in many tales, spanning thousands of years in different cultures, um, in different time periods, and it's meant different things to different people. So I believe um, in our search to stay forever young, that we've actually found the fountain of youth and that it is in our ability to educate ourselves throughout our lives. Um, I think that that's that little bit of magic that keeps us forever young. We marvel at these stories of people achieving their degrees at the age of 79, um, you know, or even older, but in truth, you're never too old to learn. Um, you're never too old to want to challenge yourself or to change, or to grow, or to want to improve. Um, there's actually a song by Bob Marley, it's called the Redemption Song, and there's a line in it that says, emancipate yourselves from mental slavery, none but ourselves can free our minds. And we have these amazing brains, they are so complex and so capable, and so awe-inspiring, and we owe it to them to constantly nourish them. I'm not only talking about education in the sense of pursuing a degree at a university. Um, I think that's what a lot of us are conditioned to think, that that's the, the only way we can grow. Um, and that if we don't enter into the illustrious walls of these universities, our ability to educate ourselves will suddenly vanish. Um, in truth, I think what the Fees Must Fall movement um, highlighted is that education, tertiary education, is not that accessible. Um, there are flaws within our own education system that still require work 20 odd years after democracy. Um, Fees Must Fall highlighted that there was inequality, that there was issues with accessibility, issues of exclusion, issues of decolonization, and issues of privilege. And that wound had to be opened so that the education system could be challenged, not to destroy it, but to revive it and to reinvent it and ultimately to improve it. Education should be viewed in a light that extends beyond formal qualifications. Um, we have to equip ourselves, we have to take onus and control of what it is we consume. Um, I like to think of it as the fountain of youth has many different streams that feed into it and they give it this magical water. So it's not just coming from one source. Um, and that's what formal education is. It is a source. It doesn't mean it is the only source that we can tap into. Um, there is knowledge that is passed down from generation to generation and it's the most beautiful thing. Human beings are the best storytellers. Um, it's something that is ingrained in our history. It's something that has helped define who we are. 
and we have all this knowledge that can be passed down from generation to generation. And it's only now, truly, that indigenous knowledge is being given the respect that it actually deserves. Um, and it's, it's teaching us to shift our perspective and our lens from this very westernized view of the world. Um, and now suddenly we're starting to expand and incorporate um, these different perspectives and to value our input as Africans. Reading is another stream, I like to think, um, that gives water to our fountain. Uh, and I don't just mean reading about things related to, you know, whatever you're studying um, or reading things that are, you know, giving a perspective on a historical um, event or things that are linked to struggle and oppression, all these, these heavy topics. I mean reading for pleasure, reading for fun, reading to escape, reading to feed your imagination. Um, we should all read stories that make us think, stories that make us feel good, stories that are true, some that are fantasy. We don't need to restrict ourselves to um, a certain way of thinking. And I think of myself and like some of my favorite books that I like to read are actually children's books. And um, some people might find it weird, but I always enjoy the whimsy of it. I like the fact that it allows me to escape. It's going to sound counterintuitive, but along with learning, we also need to unlearn a lot of things. So when we are younger, most of our learning um, can be shaped by the people we surround ourselves with and those we spend the most time with. So that could be our parents or friends or teachers. Um, and their perspectives kind of help to, to shape ours. Our community experience helps to shape our perspective of the world. And that's not necessarily always a good thing. Uh, we could develop biases um, that we don't even realize until we're placed in a situation where we're forced to confront them. And there's no shame in that there's no shame in admitting that you were wrong or you were not as educated on a topic as you maybe are now. Um, I think introspection and education go hand in hand. That I always like to think of it as there's been different versions of myself throughout my life, kind of like a butterfly um, that was once a caterpillar. So although it's still me, it's a different version of me. Um, it's not necessarily a better or worse version, but it is different. And that is kind of what you go through throughout your life is a mental metamorphosis. This day and age, there are just so many little streams that flow into our fountain. And the beauty of that is that it will never run dry. So we found the fountain of youth. We've fought for it. People have lost their lives for it. We owe it to ourselves and to every person who marched for their education, not only on June 16, not only during Fismas Fall, not only in South Africa, to continue to drink the magical waters 